Let's do something radical. Let's pray. Hmm? Well, Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for the land in which we live. With all its problems, Father, we thank you for the freedoms we enjoy and for the opportunity to gather here to open your word to our lives and our lives to your word. We pray, Father, that you would indeed be here among us. We pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished with, e with each of us as we explore your word this night. As we commit it to you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to address one of the most overlooked and yet complex and yet satisfying books in the Bible, the book of Ezekiel. And um, many of you may be startled to discover there are chapters in Ezekiel besides 38 and 39, okay? We're going to discover lots of interesting things. It's a wonderful, wonderful book, and we're going to take a look at it. But we we'll want to start off right away because we're going to encounter all kinds of conjectures and perspectives. Let's remind ourselves what Peter uh, reminds us of in his second letter. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We need to remember that. We will be fairly free with some, uh, in communicating some of the per, uh, perceptions that scholars have had about various passages. But let's also remind ourselves of our trademark verse, which is Acts 17, 11, where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you, but search the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. So we're gonna have, we're, you're going to end up uh, probably having some questions answered in the study, but you're also going to have more questions raised for you to study as we move along. So now the agenda is going to be in four pieces. We're going to talk a little bit about the historical context that we find ourselves in. It's important that you understand where Ezekiel fits in in history here. Then we'll talk a little bit in anticipation of the man himself. Who was he and, and what was his burden? We'll talk a little bit then of how the book is organized. That's worth understanding. And then, of course, we'll jump in and take the first chapter. So that's our agenda uh, for tonight. Let's start with the historical background. Those of you that have been through our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours will recognize this timeline as sort of something that ties it together. And I'm going to sort of assume that most of you have been through Learn the Bible in 24 Hours to have a broad perspective. If you haven't done that, it won't, you, it, this doesn't depend on you doing that, but I'm going to encourage you, if you haven't done that, to go ahead and undertake that either as just a private study or to do it in, in support of, a, a pers of your pursuit to a bronze medallion of the Institute. But in any case, starting with the creation, fall of man, we get through Abraham, and when we get to David, the book of Genesis covers most of that period. The rest of the Old Testament takes you from that through to the exile, the captivities. And there's a gap between the Old and New Testament that's roughly 400 years that some people call the silent years. That's a misnomer because those years are in your Bible if you know where to look. They are put there predictively in Daniel chapter five and 11, Daniel 11 verses 5 through 35. Interesting. And it is so specifically precise that uh, skeptics have said it had to be written later. But that covers those 400 years, interestingly enough. And then, of course, the New Testament occurs with just, within just one lifetime. And so, but from the Exodus through the Diaspora, we have the nation Israel. And for, then we're, we have been in this period called the Diaspora up until May 14th of 48, because Israel is in the process of being restored in unbelief to begin with and ultimately in full belief yet to come. Now, we're going to focus our study in this section between, uh, within the, what's called the exile, the captivity of the southern kingdom. It's, 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 there's a period right after the monarchy, after David uh, passes it on to Solomon. When Solomon dies, there's a civil war. They split into two houses. And uh, the Babylon, the, we'll get into that in the next slide here. Major prophets cover this period. The minor prophets cover even a larger period. Major and minor is strictly a librarian's term in terms of how heavy they are, how many pages. Many of the little minor prophets are nuggets. So understand that they're... Uh, 
Uh, that, that major and minor is a source of a lot of misunderstanding. If we look at the two kingdoms and their line of kings, the southern kingdom, they called themselves the house of Judah, and the northern kingdom counted, labeled themselves as the house of Israel. When you see the term Israel, it can mean the whole nation. More often than not, it does. And yet sometimes when it says king of Israel, they mean in contrast the king of Judah. In other words, it's the house. So don't let that confuse in your studies. And first and second kings are the primary chronicles, if you will, of those two uh, kingdoms. The northern kingdom goes from bad to worse. The kings get more and more idolatrous as they go, and they finally, they're so bad that um, they go from 975 to about 721. They last for 250 years, but in 721, they cease to exist because the Assyrians not only take them captive, they distribute them throughout their empire, and they bring other people, non-Jews, into that region. And that s sets the stage for what we call Samaritans. But in any case, the, so the northern kingdom ceases. They're eliminated from history, so far at least. The, the southern kingdom lasts for 370 years, and, uh, but it too, it, ha it goes in general from bad to worse, except they do have about five kings that are pretty sharp. So they're interspersed with some good guys. And we're not going to go through all that here. Our, our commentaries on First and Kings will deal with that. But uh, there are two kingdoms here. The northern kingdom had 19 kings that reigned 250 years. They had seven different dynasties in the north. That led to ultimately the Assyrian captivity. I could say annihilation, really. They don't return from that as a nation. The southern kingdom, Judah, has 20 kings, but one dynasty. What dynasties is that? David's, right. They reigned for 370 years, one dynasty. But they, because of, a number, because of the idolatry and their failure to be faithful, get thrown into the Babylonian captivity. There's only one reason they weren't wiped out. That's because of God's commitment to David. And that's what Ezekiel is going to be all about. That's what the epistle of the Hebrews is all about. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's the fulfillment of the Davidic dynasty. It's called the millennium. And uh, so we'll be looking at that heavily in the book of Ezekiel. Now, 612, that's when Nineveh falls to, the, uh, to the, an alliance of Babylonian media. In the 609, Pharaoh Necho leads his army against Assyria. But Josiah fights Necho and gets killed. Why is Josiah fi fighting with Pharaoh Necho? Nobody knows for sure. It's my belief is because he was trying to get the Ark of the Covenant back from Pharaoh Necho, who, under, who, under whose protection it had fled. Pharaoh Necho, incidentally, was not Egyptian. He was Ethiopian. But in any case, Josiah gets killed, and it's three years later that Nebuchadnezzar's son is an outstanding general, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And he, he takes arms against Pharaoh Necho and defeats him at the Battle of Karshemesh which is a major milestone in the history of the world, even in secular terms. And that's on the west bank of the Euphrates. That means at that point, Babylon is the most powerful player in the region. So that means then, as you get to the end of the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, you've got a line of kings, Joaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakin, and Zedekiah. And then the, then the final captivity. We're going to get into the details there a little bit more. But you need to understand that the prophets that are contemporaneous with those events are Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Obadiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel being the major prophets that are covering the period we're talking about. Ezekiel is contemporaneous with Daniel and also with Jeremiah, although Jeremiah is an older person at this point. Both Daniel and Ezekiel probably as young teens probably heard Jeremiah preach. There's no record of that, but we wouldn't be a bit surprised. And uh, so, so in 606, is with, with Nebuchadnezzar having succeeded at the Battle of Karshemesh, on his way home, he lays siege to Jerusalem, lays siege, subdues it, and takes hostages. And the uh, first of three deportations. The first deportation, he takes really just basically hostages, sets up a vassal king in place, and goes back home to, to assume the, the kingship because his dad has died, and he's now king. Not only is he general of the army, he's king of Babylon. Daniel is among those in the first deportation. 
And as you know the story of Daniel, uh, he rises to be virtually the prime minister of Babylon, interestingly enough. What's even more profound is when the Persians ultimately conquer Babylon, he rises to power in the Persian Empire, number three in the empire. Anyway, that brings us to 597 B.C. Remember, these are B.C., so they descend as you get later, right? In 597, there's a second group. What's going on is that uh, there are false prophets advising the king of, Israel, uh, of Judah. He's supposed to be a vassal in Nebuchadnezzar. But the false prophets are telling him, we're, the, we're God's people. Rise up and God will give us the victory. Jeremiah is telling him, don't do that. Nebuchadnezzar is God's instrument here. They don't listen. They rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar lays a second siege and takes another bunch of hostages. And at that second bunch, there's a young guy by the name of Ezekiel who was about 25 years old at that time. Now, he is taken to a town called Tel Aviv. No relation to the Tel Aviv of today. Don't get those confused. That's, it happened to be a town near a ship canal that we're going to be talking about here a little bit. So even though he's a captive in Babylon, he's, he lives in his own house with his beloved wife. We're going to encounter that as we get further into the study. Five years after he came to Tel Aviv, he was called to be a prophet of God when he was 30 years old. There's going to be a little bit of discussion about that 30 years, but in any case, uh, that's the, that was the minimum age for a priest anyway. He is a priest, but he never served as a priest. You'll see why in a minute. And 30 is when he became of age to be a priest. It's also 30 years since Josiah had his big revival, and some scholars put, uh, put that as a key point there. All of this, though, at this point, is six years prior to the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem, because between the second deportation and the third deportation, the false prophet, and in the second deportation, they, they, he puts uh, uh, an uncle in charge by the name of Zedekiah, and the same scenario takes place. Both Jeremiah and Ezekiel are saying, don't rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. He's the instrument of God. But the false prophets are saying, no, 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 we're God's people. If you rebel, God will give us the victory. And uh, the ego trip finally takes hold. So Zedekiah, just like his predecessor, rebels. And by this time, Nebuchadnezzar has had a belly full of the whole operation. So he sets a third siege takes a whole bunch captive, and levels Jerusalem. That should take care of that, right? That's the destruction of Jerusalem. And we'll talk about the distinctions here in a minute. But this event here, six years before that destruction, Jeremiah was ministering to the people back home. Ezekiel was preaching to the Jews in captivity in Babylon. So understand, Ezekiel's in Babylon, 200 miles to the, or so to the east. Jeremiah is among the, re the, the remnants that have been left in Jerusalem. And so, and both Jeremiah and Ezekiel were, were uh, priests, but called to be a prophet. Okay, so let's get this clear. The first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, then there's a second and a third siege. The first siege triggers a period of time called the servitude of the nation. The nation is no longer sovereign. It's now a subservient king to Nebuchadnezzar, the servitude of the nation. That's when captivities begin. Even the people that are living in Jerusalem are captive, in a sense, uh, to Babylon. Okay. What ends the servitude of the nation is the decree of Cyrus, because the Persians conquer Babylon. He reads a letter that was written to him by God in Isaiah 150 years before he was born, calling him by name and outlining his career. He's impressed. So he issues the decree for them to be released and go home. In fact, he gives them money to help rebuild their temple. That's the... That, that, that starts, that, that's where we mark the dominance of the Persian Empire from. Second Chronicles deals with all of this. The book of Ezra deals with their attempt to return and rebuild their temple. Cyrus has even given money to do that. They don't get very far for a better part of 20 years because they can't defend themselves. They can, they're allowed to build a temple. They can't build a wall and, defend and, and, and make, remake a city-state out of it. The third siege is what leveled Jerusalem. That triggers a 70-year period called the Desolations of Jerusalem. And both these periods are 70 years exactly to the day, but they're not coterminous. That is, they have different starts and ending points. The servitude of the nation is 70 years to the day, interestingly enough. 
The desolations of Jerusalem is also seven years. It ends by a different thing. Ezra can't get anywhere. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the then king, and he gets permission to rebuild Jerusalem from Artaxerxes Longimanus. That decree triggers the prophecy that Gabriel gave Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, called the 70 weeks. But that ends the desolations of Jerusalem. Two different periods, 70 years each. Kind of interesting. We're going to talk about that a little further later on when we get to Daniel 4, because there's some astonishing possibilities hidden behind the text that we'll take a look at. The book of Esther, by the way, actually predates Nehemiah about 30 years, and it's probably more important than most people realize, because without Esther, Nehemiah would have been impossible, and without, uh, without the Jews, they would, have been, uh, they would have been wiped out 500 years before Christ came into the world. There's a whole act of God involved in all of this to make, to make happen what we're taking advantage of ourselves. So, anyway, that's enough of that. Jeremiah is a prophet that prior to the first siege, prior and subsequent to the first siege. Daniel is a young man, and Ezekiel, or both of those are young guys that are, uh, Daniel taken in the first siege, Ezekiel actually in the second siege. Haggai and Zechariah are prophets after the exile, so they're called post-exile prophets. We're going to focus our interest on what's called the exile, and the exile prophets are Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and finally Malachi are post-exile. They're prophets to the returnees after they were released from captivity. So, okay, now let's talk a little bit about Ezekiel, the guy himself. The word means God strengthens or will strengthen. And we, we're mispronouncing it. Yezekiel is, the, is somewhat the way that Hebrews might pronounce the Ezek, what we call Ezekiel. He's one of the three captivity prophets. The other two are Jeremiah and Daniel. It was during the 11-year reign of Jehoiakim that the first deportation takes place when Daniel was taken captive. Daniel was a young man, but he was also writing at that time. The book of Daniel had already started. And he'd been taken to the court of the king. When he's captured, they take the most promising young men. He was of the royal line, by the way. We're not sure exactly where. But he was also taken with three of his buddies into a special postgraduate school at the Babylonian court. And he eventually arises to become prime minister, and that's one of the great sagas in, the, in Daniel chapter 2 and following. It's interesting, Ezekiel never mentions Jeremiah, even though they're obviously contemporaneous. But he does mention, Ezekiel mentions Daniel three times in his writing, interestingly enough. Ezekiel was a priest, but he never served that because he was taken into captivity before he was 30 years old. He was 25. And that was in the reign of, he was, the second deportation was in the reign of Jehoiachin. Now, Jehoiachin is confusing because he's also called Jeconiah and Coniah. Those are all alternative names for Jehoiachin. In this study, I'll try to stick with Jehoiachin so I don't confuse you. His father was Jehoiakim, okay? But uh, Jehoiachin was the king that followed Jehoiakim, and uh, he came to the throne, and he only reigned three months before he gets dealt with by Nebuchadnezzar. And he also, by the way, is the object of the blood curse that God pronounced on the royal line that, in effect, sets up the require one of the reasons that we have a virgin birth. Or maybe it's the other way around, really, but anyway, that's okay. Jeremiah was an old man about this time. He began his ministry a young man during the reign of Josiah, which is a couple of kings back, and Josiah was one of the really good kings, a young fellow, but he did well. And uh, J Jeremiah stay remains with the remnant in the land, and he was later taken down into Egypt. Ezekiel's with the captives who'd been brought down to the rivers of Babylon. He's not at court. He's at the river Chebar, or Kibar. The captives had been placed by a great canal that came off the river Euphrates, which was several miles from Babylon, and Ezekiel's ministry was among those people, probably down there to till the land. That's, our, that's just a surmise on our part. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel each had a peculiar ministry to a particular group of people. They apparently never came in contact with each other, interestingly enough. And uh, you know, from the record in the book of Daniel, you don't gather Daniel ever visited his people in Babylon, even though he's at the court. He probably didn't, you know, deal with that down there. He had great concern for them, and he, he obviously defends them. So uh, 
He's, we know that Daniel was acquainted with the prophecies of Jeremiah because his reading of Jeremiah's prophecy is the central, one of the central points of the ninth chapter of Daniel and what follows. So uh, we suspect that when he was a young man still in, in uh, Jerusalem, he probably uh, sat at the feet of Jeremiah for all we know. And uh, Ezekiel also was a young man. And he also may have had the benefit of teachings by Jeremiah. So, but it's interesting that realize that when Ezekiel is talking, he is in Babylon. Yet he is able to see what's going on in Jerusalem by the Spirit of God. Don't let that confuse you. Ezekiel not only proclaimed God's message to the people, he was instructed by God to do the most bizarre things, to act out his message. And he will engage in the most weird behavior that you can imagine. God commands him to do a number of what we, we would call symbolic acts, okay, in order to get the attention of the people. They didn't have television then. He shuts himself up in his home. He binds himself. He is struck dumb. He was supposed to lie on his right and then his left sides for a total of 430 days. That's a long time. He ate bread that was prepared in an unclean manner. I'll spare you the details. He shaved his head and beard, which was considered a shame in his particular calling. But he did. He played at war in chapter 4. He lies on his side and all that in chapter 4. We'll deal with that when we get there, of course. He shaved his hair and beard in chapter 5. He acted like someone fleeing from war in chapter 12. He's acting out his message, if you will. He would sit and sigh in chapter 21. And the most difficult thing he had to do is watch his wife die. It was not easy to be a prophet in those days. There's a conflict of messages that even the enemies take advantage of or try to. Jeremiah had told them to settle down in Babylon for 70 years, but the false prophets in Jerusalem told the people that God would destroy Babylon and set the captives free. That's all through Jeremiah's writing, particularly chapter 28 and 29. It was Ezekiel's task in Babylon to tell the people that it's the other way around. God is going to destroy Jerusalem, not Babylon. That was not a popular message. Neither Jeremiah's message or Ezekiel's was very popular. Jeremiah was called a traitor and thrown in a dungeon. His message didn't go over. It was not user or friendly. <laughs> But Ezekiel's message also points out that even though Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, there would be a day coming where the glorious restoration of the people and a rebuilding of the temple. The temple that, that uh, Ezekiel will be detailing is not the temple that we're looking toward being built on the near horizon. It's the one after that. There will be a temple built in Jerusalem. That temple will be desecrated by the Antichrist. The temple Ezekiel's talking about is the one that it comes after that. We'll try to make that clear when we get there. So the organization of his book, let's talk about this a little bit so you have a feeling for it. The book is divided into three sections, following the, four if you count the call. The first three chapters are the call of Ezekiel to the office of a prophet. But then chapter, uh, uh, chapters 4 to 24 is God's judgment on Jerusalem, very unpopular topic. Chapters 25 through 32 are God's judgment on the surrounding nations, and I think you'll be shocked when you, do, when, when you get into that, thanks to the efforts of Walid Shabbat, a PLO terrorist, who revealed to us the possibilities that those passages may include. And then chapters 30, the rest of the, the book, 33 to 48, is God's restoration of the Jews in the kingdom, in the kingdom. That's going to include some famous passages, the Valley of the Dry Bones, the Gog and Magog invasion, and the millennium itself are embraced from 33 to 48. So chapters 1 to 24 were penned before the siege of Jerusalem. Ezekiel's deported, but before, up, and, up until the siege. Chapters 25 through 32, all these judgments that are happening on the Gentile nations, let me add the Muslim nations, are, are being detailed by Ezekiel while the siege in Jerusalem is going on. The rest of the book was written after the siege of Jerusalem. Okay. Ezekiel's called a prophecy, first few chapters. Then we have uh, a four chapters worth of symbolical predictions of the destruction of Jerusalem. Then 14 months later, Ezekiel will record a vision of the temple, 
polluted by false worship by Thomas and Adonis, God's subsequent scattering of fire over the city and the forsaking of the temple to reveal himself to an inquiring people in exile. So God is going to, on the one hand, reveal all this to them in, 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 that, in those visions. But Ezekiel hammers away for three chapters that a happier and better times will follow. Now, there's a strange passage from 12 to 19 where the passage where Ezekiel it is exposed to Ezekiel the astonishing sins prevalent within the priesthood in Jerusalem and the, among the priests, the prophets, and the princes. And it's those sins that are going to bring it all home to roost. A year later, there's a warning of judgment for national guilt repeated with greater distinctiveness as the time gets closer and closer. So that's chapters 20 through 23. Two years and five months later, the very day on which Ezekiel speaks, that's when the siege of Jerusalem begins where Jerusalem will be overthrown. And chapter 24 nails that. But then we have these strange passages about prediction against the Muslim nations during the interval of silence toward his own people. If judgment begins at the house of God, much more will it visit the ungodly world. And that's what it'll deal with for those chapters. And uh, so some of these were uttered later, but they all began to be given after the fall of Jerusalem. In the twelfth year of the captivity, when the fugitives of Jerusalem had appeared in Chaldea, Ezekiel foretells better times, the reestablishment of Israel, the triumph of God's kingdom on earth over its enemies, Islam and Gog and all of that. That'll be all covered by the time you get to the end of chapter 39. Then after an interval of 13 years, the closing vision of the restored kingdom is laid out from chapters 40 through 48. Even a floor plan of the temple will be there. So here's the outline. First three chapters, call of God's judgment. 424, God's judgment on Jerusalem. That's all given before the siege. Then we have the God's judgment on the Muslim nations. That's during the siege. And then we have the restoration of the Jews given after the siege. And finally, they return to their land. They experience a whole new unity and life. And they're, they're protected from Gog and Magog. And then we have the millennium. Everybody thinks the millennium, well, that's just one chapter in the book of Re Revelation. No, it's not. Most of what we know about the millennium is from chapters in, is in Isaiah, uh, 66 and others, and, uh, chapters, and eight chapters in, or nine chapters in, in uh, Ezekiel. Okay, so we finally got through the warm-up. Let's get into the, the book itself, chapter 1. We're going to see a vision of the chariot of God. And there's been more nonsense, speculations, conjectures about this by people who are making wild guesses. I want you to stop and think. I'm, I've, in the interest of time, did not get into a little tutorial on hyperspaces, hyperdimensionality. You and I are familiar with three dimensions. We actually live in four. Length, width, and height, and time. Four dimensions. The universe, we now know from our scientists, has ten dimensions, at least. And four of them are directly perce perceivable. The six are hidden from us, in effect. I believe that many of the things we see in the Bible are glimpses outside our own dimensionality. So it's silly and futile, in fact, uh, foolhardy, to try to visualize fourth and fifth and sixth dimensional things within our three dimensions. That, that just betrays a lack of understanding. But let's, on that kind of prelude, let's presume that God's chariot has more than three or four dimensions. And so we're going to just see representations of different kinds at best. This is not an aircraft. It's not a UFO. And enough said. What I do believe, the Holy Spirit put it here to communicate to you and me. And what we need to do is let the text speak to you personally. Let it say to you what it's trying to say to you. You don't have to have a degree in advanced math to deal with that, okay? There are only two kinds of people that can deal in spaces of more, uh, dimensions more than three. That's mathematicians with special training and small children, okay? Now, we live in four. We went through all this in some of our other materials, a hypercube, a four-dimensional cube unraveled into three and all that sort of stuff. Forget all that stuff. Let the text speak to you. 
Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. The thirtieth year. From what? Lots of conjectures. To cut through it, I believe the thirtieth year alludes to his maturity. When he's thirty years old, he's now allowed to be a priest. He's already been called by God at year when he was twenty-five. But now he's officially allowed to perform as a priest. Okay. He also, it turns out, was born on the day of Josiah's revival. So many scholars suspect that Israel had a fresh start with Josiah, and that's why we're, we're marking time from that point. That's an interesting possibility, because Ezekiel apparently was born during that revival. There are all kinds of other conjectures I'll spare you detailing, because most of them don't make sense. Most, many of them are refutable. None of them are as relevant as the one I've suggested, and the one I've suggested is what most of the commentators tend to cling to. So I won't go through all of those. They're there in your notes if you want to chase some of those down. But he said, it was in the fourth month on the fifth day of the month. That's not quite yet the time of destruction of Jerusalem. That took place in the reign of Zedekiah, a subsequent thing. This is it's still a little early yet. Now, if you read Psalm 137, you'll discover that the captives are really depressed. They're captives. They hang their harps on trees. Psalm 137, I believe, is the one that details that for you. And 137 opens up with that whole, the, 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 describing the depression of the captives. While the captives are on their pity party, or down, feeling down, what happens for, for Ezekiel? The heavens were open. What a contrast. And I saw visions of God. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you have had visions of God, okay? But uh, there are visions like this that were given to Isaiah in chapter 6. There's an equivalent kind of scene that unfolds in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And they all tie together. I'll leave it to you to go look them over, compare, and draw what inferences you might. But he continues in the next verse, in the fifth day of the month, which is in the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. He's the son of Jehoiakim, and he's only going to reign for about three months, he's, okay? But it, it, of his captivity, Jehoiachin's been a captive. Not yet the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in Zedekiah, which follows him. The, he, Jehoiachin was the 18th and next to the last king of Judah. He was a son of a petty tyrant called Jehoiakim, the grandson of the godly jo, uh, Josiah. His name means the Lord establishes. He was actually enthroned by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. He reigned only three months when he was deported to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar in the year 597, along with the upper classes. So he's a, he's a the, actual, the king is a prisoner here. And he's later released by a, a son of Nebuchadnezzar in 560, the 37th year of his exile. The fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity is the first of the 14 date references in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel has many of these date references for your, for your perusal. Verse 3, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the, pre, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. That's a phrase that's going to repeat itself many times in this thing. The river Kibar. That's a main canal that came off the Euphrates River that watered an area, and we assume that the captives were there because they were probably uh, tasked with tilling that ground. This area is quite a few miles away from Babylon to the southeast. And uh, evidently the Jewish captives were put there, as I say, for agricultural uh, servitude. And the, 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 the Great River, the Grand Canal, it's an artificial water course in the Euphrates. There are a lot of those around there. And it began above Babylon, flows southeast, passed through Nippur, the site of ancient Jewish settlements, and archaeologists have confirmed a lot of this. And it joins the Euphrates again back below Ur. And uh, they, 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 they swing a lot, these rivers. And Ezekiel's home was on the river Kibar at Tel Aviv. It was the principal colony of the exiles near the city of Nippur, southeast of Babylon. Ezekiel continues, and I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof was the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Out of the north. This is a very strange phrase, because yes, their enemies always did come from the north in that geography, but also that term seems to be used in the Bible frequently in reference to God's 
uh, uh, throne. In Isaiah 14, in Psalm 75, we, the, the, the sides of the north seem to suggest God's throne in, in some kind of mystical way. This fire enfolding itself, a brightness was about it. Out of the midst thereof was the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. You know, it's interesting how all through the Bible, God is pictured as a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, we ran into it there. God is light, 1 John 1. Paul, the time of his conversion, saw a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. That's bright. That's really bright. In fact, that may have given Paul his eye problem that we see alluded to in the book of Galatians. Continuing, verse 5, Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And these are living creatures. These aren't just visions. These are living creatures of some kind. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Four living creatures. Now they're called uh, cherubim or cherubim in, uh, later on in Ezekiel chapter 10. These had the likeness of a man. The word likeness means similar but not identical with. And we're going to see this referred to in verse 26 of this chapter before I through here. And this is not a tautology. Likeness expresses a general form. Appearance is a particular aspect. If the two words were synonymous, then you'd call that a tautology. They're not. Likeness is the broader term. Appearance is the more is a particular aspect, if we can deal with that. The Hebrew words are slightly different. Demuth is likeness, which occurs ten times. Mare is appearance, which deals uh, fourteen times. It's clear that even in the phrasing here the trans from the translation, the prophet senses that the, the, the inadequacy of human language to express that which is not expressible. Now, these super angels we encounter all through the Bible. Some places, sometimes they're called cherubim. Cherub in the Renaissance art has got nothing to do with the biblical term. The cherubim are super angels, very powerful. You first encounter a couple of them guarding the tree of the way to the tree of life in Genesis 3. You also find them embellished on the mercy seat. We also find them embroidered on the curtains and the tabernacle and so forth. They're very prominent in priestly uh, uh, symbols here. There's another kind of creature that's called a seraphim in Isaiah. It only shows up in Isaiah. He's, they may be the same thing. Many scholars think they're just two different expressions of the same kind of creature. Except the cherubim are pictured with four wings and the seraphim with six wings. So that at least hints that they may not be the same. There's some form of super angels of some kind. But, uh, and the other thing about cherubim, I forgot to mention, by the way, Hasatan, Satan, in, uh, in Isaiah 14, or actually, it's, we're going to encounter that in Ezekiel 28. He is apparently was the cherub that covereth. So we know Satan was originally a cherubim before he fell. He apparently was in charge of the whole, uh, whole, the whole gang because he's the cherub that covereth. That means that's the way, uh, Hebraism, of, he was in charge. But he fell through pride and became uh, the, our accuser, which uh, word Satan means. So at least one of the cherubim went wrong and took a third of the angels with him, apparently, according to Revelation 12. Now in Revelation, we find living creatures again mentioned. They're translated beats, uh, beasts in the King James, but that's unfortunate because there's another term for beasts where they're beasts. In chapters 4 and 5 where it says, uh, uh, the, it's a different word, zoan, it's better, better translated living creatures because beasts are a, a negative kind of term. These are living creatures in chapters, um, uh, chapter 4 and 5 in, in Revelation. But it's interesting that in each of the visions of the throne of God, we encounter these super creatures, sometimes with six wings, sometimes four, and probably with some other differences too, if you really study them carefully. But they do have a common characteristic that we're going to take some interest in here a little later. There's also the possibility that the angels themselves are polymorphs. That is, they can take different forms. Sometimes they may appear as a seraphim, sometimes as a cherub. That, that's... that's wouldn't be surprising because, again, we're dealing in a hyperspace here. Everyone had four faces. That means there's 16 faces here because you've got four of these creatures, right? But each one had four faces, and every one had four wings. We're going to see, though, in, in verse 10, we're going to deal with those four faces. Their feet were straight feet. 
No knuckles, no knees, no bending for some reason. The sole of their feet was like the sole of a cast foot, round in other words, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had, on, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they, had, and they four had their faces and their wings. And their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. Now these creatures, among other things, symbolize the glory and power of God. They're guarding His throne, apparently. They always go straight forward. I do think there's a deliberate pun involved here. James tells us they ha that God has no variables nor turning. It's that very word, parallax, that we get the word parallax from. It focused on infinity, in effect. Apparently, these could see in all directions, and they move in all directions without turning. Very strange. Again, that speaks to me that these are very definitely hyperdimensional. As for the likeness of their faces, the four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Wow. Four faces. Do those sound familiar to you? Absolutely. You've got a lot of nods there. The cherubim have four faces, a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. The camp of Israel is formed around four primary ensigns, ensign of Judah, Ephraim, Reuben, and Dan, whose respective ensign symbols were the lion, the ox, the man, and an eagle. Dan was originally a serpent, so they had an eagle with a serpent in its mouth, and Ezer, the head of the tribe of Daniel, didn't like that, so they changed it to, a, to an eagle. So that's how that all happened. The Gospels, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What has that got to do with the lion, ox, man, and eagle? For those of you that may not have studied the Gospels or that learned the Bible 24 hours, let's take, refresh your memory here a little bit. Every detail in the Bible is there deliberately. What do you suppose could be hidden behind the, camps, the camp of Israel? Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. So we can tell you right now that not only are they deliberately there, they somehow appoint to Christ. When you get to Numbers 2, there's the detailing of the size of each of the 12 tribes. And so you can go through the numbers, and it doesn't seem to reveal much, but we also know that they were to camp in four camps of three tribes each. The first, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, together would camp and call themselves the camp of Judah. Reuben, Simeon, Gad were the camp of Reuben, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, the camp of Ephraim, and Dan, Asher, and Naphtali, the camp of Dan. If we tally the sums of each of the um, camps, that may be more fruitful for us. Well, we need to know something else. In the, in the center, we have uh, the, 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 the layout of the tabernacle. I've got east to the bottom here. We have the Levites, Moses and priests, on the open side where the door is. And we have the Kirshanites, Kohathites, and Merites, the other three families of the Levites around them, respectively. Okay. You need to understand, you've got to think like a rabbi. They were told the camp of Judah was to be east of the Levites. The camp of Reuben was supposed to be south of the Levites. That gives us an interesting problem. If you're going to be strict to the law, to the Torah, there's, no way, there's nobody that can camp southeast, either south or east of the instructions. Only the cardinal directions are thus ordained. And how wide can they? Well, the width of the Levite's camp is what's allowed. How, is, how big is the, the Levite's camp? I don't know. But whatever it is, that's the unit we're going to use. And then the, they'll take whatever length they need proportional to their populations. Let's dramatize that. Here they are. There's about 22,000 uh, in the numbering of the Levites. So the width there we'll take for the tribe of Judah, whose symbol is the lion. They can camp that wide and take whatever space they need um, uh, eastward. Reuben, his symbol is the man, and he does the same thing. He takes whatever he needs going um, southward. Who can camp in the southeast? None of them. It's not allowed, according to the Torah. The same thing with southwest, northwest, northeast. So Ephraim is to the, to the west, the symbol is the ox, and Dan is to the north with the symbol of the eagle. Now, how much do they need? Well, it depends what the populations are. Let's take a look at those populations, and if we do it to scale, guess what we see? The cross of Christ. And uh, if you're approaching it from the east, it is rather impressive because the longest of the populations is the tribe of Judah, which is 108, the camp of Judah, camp of Judah, 108,400. 
The, the shortest is the one to the west, Ephraim, 108,000. And the other two arms are essentially the same length, 150 and some odd. And it's interesting that they portray the throne of God when laid out. We have four faces implied from the four primary standards. All 12 tribes pick up a sign of the Matzeroth, what we would call the zodiac, but, uh, and the zodiac spells out the plan of God from the virgin birth of Virgo to the, the triumph of the Leo the lion, or the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so much for that one. Design of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Matthew's theme is that he speaks of the Messiah, the king. Mark, the servant. Luke, is, is being a doctor, is, is humanity. And John, the son of God. And so the genealogies reflect that very clearly. Matthew takes them from Abraham on. Ma Mark does not have a genealogy. We don't, you don't con you're not concerned with the pedigree of a servant. Luke takes it from Adam, focusing on the bloodline through Mary. And John has a genealogy of the pre-existent one, not usually recognized as a genealogy, but the first three verses really are. And uh, they, they focus separately on what Jesus said, what he did, what he felt, and who he was. And uh, one was written to the Jew, the other to the Roman, the Greek, and the church. And the first miracle supports that basic theme. And... Uh, it ends with an appropriate. Matthew ends with the resurrection, Mark the ascension. Luke ends with the promise of the Spirit, setting up his sequel called Luke Volume 2, the book of Acts. John ends with the promise of the return, setting up his sequel, which is the book of Revelation. The camp uh, on each, the campside correlative each other, east, east, west, south, and north. The ensigns was Judah, Ephraim, Reuben, and Dan. And so the face... Matthew focuses on his kingship, symbolized by the lion. Mark, the ox, the beast of servitude. Luke, the man. And John, the eagle. So that's interesting. These four faces show up again. And uh, there may be significance to that. Is, it, is that significant? That's up to you. You can look at it and come to your own conclusions. Let's go to verse 11. Thus were faces, their wings were stretched upward. The two wings of every one were joined one to another, and the two covered their bodies. They went every one straight forward. Whither the Spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. They went straight forward. God is moving undeviatingly. We look at the world and get confused. God's not confused. He knows what He's doing. And he is moving, God is moving unhesitatingly toward the accomplishment of his purpose in the world today. We need to remember that. And this speaks to that, strangely enough. I believe it does. Nothing will deter God. Nothing can sidetrack him. He's going to do what he's going to do. Praise God. Continuing verse 13, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Wow. The appearance of lamps. God is always said to be light, 1 John 1, 5. I am the light of the world, John 8. And uh, John again, 1 John, I, uh, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Praise God. Continuing, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they four had one likeness, their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Barrel, by the way, is probably the chrysolite or goldstone, probably corresponding to a gold-colored topaz is the estimate. The, the, the whole area of semi-precious stones is a... a uh, very confusing thing to research because the nomenclature throughout all the different cultures is different and changing. It's very hard to trace these things. But the work was as it were as a wheel within the wheel. This is not orthogonal. Excuse me, it's orthogonal, not concentric. Don't picture wheels inside the wheels say we'd see it. Visualize them orthogonal, perpendicular to each other, much like some gyroscopes are set up that way. It's, they're orthogonal, not concentric. Because they go... Uh, and, and they go in more than three dimensions. That's why it's confusing to us. They're probably hyperdimensional. Uh, in other words, more than three dimensions. We find wheels, though, mystically in Daniel 7. The wheels of the throne of God are mentioned in Daniel 7, verse 9. 
We see the, 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 in uh, all kinds of bases in Solomon's temple have wheels on them. And, of course, the chariot in uh, 1 Chronicles 28. So, uh, on we go. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not when they went. Now, see, again, it speaks of it being hyperdimensional. See, God is a God of intelligent purpose. You and I are not living in a universe that with, that's moving into the future aimlessly and without purpose. Randomness does not exist in nature. You cannot find randomness in nature. That's what led to the field of chaos, a field of mathematics called chaos theory. You cannot find randomness. And uh, we're not living in a random universe. It's amazing to me to notice those liberals, as they call themselves, that insist that, uh, that there's no constants in the universe. They feel the universe is some kind of cosmic accident. It's fascinating to see them struggle so hard to try to find meaning in their lives. They jump on the silliest pursuits to somehow give meaning to their lives, whether it's some ecological pursuit that is, doesn't make sense or whether it's some of the positions they take in politics doesn't, are, are astonishingly stupid. And yet they are, and literally, uh, Anyone that attributes design to randomness doesn't understand the definition of either one of those two words. They're opposites. So we're not living in a universe that's moving into the future aimlessly. We're in a, we're in a universe that's pursuing a purpose because there's a guy in control and he has a purpose. He doesn't deviate from it. God has a purpose for every atom which he's created and he has a purpose for you. The very fact that you and I are alive today reveals that we are to accomplish a purpose of some kind for God. Continuing, as for the rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. The word awesome might be more precise. And their rings were full of eyes round about them four. Okay, they're full of eyes. And Proverbs 15 talks about that too. Picturing the omniscience of God as he rules his creation, the movements of his wheels and the cherubim are congruent. And his movements and the wheels, and they're all congruent with his vision. He knows what he's doing. And all of this speaks of God constantly working in the world, his power, his glory, the purpose of man, and his providence. All these things, all this derives from this perception. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. And these wheels seem to speak of the ceaseless activity and energy of God. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went, with the, thither was the Spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over and against them, for the Spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And so, these four living creatures guard the throne of God. That's what happens in Revelation 4 and elsewhere. They protect the throne in that they do not allow man and his sin to come into the presence of God. And they also indicate the way that man is to come. So they do both, if you will. That's why when they, in Genesis 3, when the cherubs are guarding the tree of life, they're not there to keep Adam out. They're there to make sure he has a way to get back, but not as a sinner. It would be dangerous if, he, if, if Adam took the, of the tree of life as a sinner, he'd be condemned to that permanently. That's why they're there to, in effect, protect him in that, by that, strangely enough. Anyway... Verse 21, when those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over and against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels, and the likeness of the firmament, oh boy, here's that funny word again, upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of a terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. The firmament is a awesome, not ter oh, better word than terrible, awesome crystal stretched over their heads. What do you mean firmament? The word is rakia. It actually means a solid expense. It's not emptiness. We think of space as being empty. No, that's, that's uh, lack of uh, uh, background. Space has impedance. Space can be stretched, rolled. Um, so it can be torn, Scripture tells us. The rakia, solid expense. That term occurs 17 times in the Scriptures, and it, it's prominent in Genesis chapter 1. You can check out our Genesis commentary on that if you so choose. There was some kind of beautiful platform above the wheels and the cherubim containing the throne of God. And under the firmament were their wings straight and one toward the other. Every one had two which covered this side and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies. See, God is still on the throne and His will is being accomplished in this world even if we don't see what He's doing, obviously. And the complex movements of the cherubim and the wheels reveal how intricate 
is God's providence in the universe. Perfect harmony and order. May not look that way to us, but clearly that's what it's portraying here. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings and the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of a host. When they stood, they let down their wings. The voice of the Almighty. By the way, this echoes the seven thunders in Psalm 29, and it possibly may be an allusion to the seven thunders that are redacted out of the book of Revelation in chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. John says, I heard the seven thunders order the voice. I was about to write, so see thou do it not. He wouldn't allow him to write that down. And uh, so that's one of the mysteries that we deal with in the Re Revelation commentaries. Sounds. Like the noise of great waters, we see that all through the Scripture and the Psalms and Isaiah and elsewhere. Like the thunder of the Almighty, the voice of God. And that's seven times in Psalm 29, and seven thunders are in Revelation 10. As the sound of a tumult, like the sound of a host. And that, uh, that also echoes throughout the Scripture. The word Almighty, by the way, is Shaddai, a pre-Mosaic term for God used chiefly in poetry and prose. It's usually uh, prefixed with the word El, El Shaddai, God the Almighty, as in Genesis 17. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads, and when they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. Sapphire stone is probably an azure stone, like the lapis lazuli, and, uh, but that's speculation. And the appearance of a man. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The only one. Uh, Isaiah has a wonderful thing in here. Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of God, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. And those feet will be nailed to a cross when, it does be, when he does become incarnate. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, the appearance of the loins, uh, even of upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about it. So we see this portrayal of uh, both above and below his loins. The appearance of the bow there's a, uh, that is in the cloud in the day by rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and was heard and, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Wow. In the presence of the Lord, Ezekiel does what? He finds himself horizontal on the ground. And throughout the Old Testament, when men came to the presence of God, they always fell on their faces. That happens to Isaiah in Isaiah 6, that famous vision in Isaiah 6. Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That was Isaiah's play as he went, fell prostrate before God. That was the same thing that happened to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10. That's the same position John took in the book of Revelation on Patmos. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as what? As dead. See, the re result of Ezekiel's vision that we've just read was that he was a total collapse on the part of Ezekiel. But God then set him up on his feet. That happens in each case. God will set them up on his feet called him to be a watchman. He fed him with the Word and filled him with the Spirit. Boy, that should be our prayer too. To be feed on the Word and be filled with the Spirit. That's a prelude to anything that's going to survive. And then we find that strange phrase, they shall know that I am the Lord. That is repetitive all through the book of Ezekiel. Over 70 times that phrase is found in this book. And it summarized the ministry and the message of Ezekiel. So this is a great warm-up chapter. The glory. What, what is the impact of all of this that we've read? Well, it gave Ezekiel a message for those that lived in Tel Aviv. It also transported him from his home in exile to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court of the temple in Jerusalem. We're going to see that in chapter 8. Ezekiel will be transported into Jerusalem. It also departed from the, he departed from the cherubim in the temple to the threshold of the temple. He saw the glory depart from the temple. It mounted up from the threshold to the eastern gate of the temple. This is the, the Shekinah glory moving. Went up from the midst of the city to the Mount of Olives on the east side of the city. 
and then returned, it will return to fill the new temple and cleanse the people. Notice this. The Shekinah glory left the temple that was in Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar eventually destroys. There's no record of the Shekinah glory coming upon um, the second temple. Why? Well, Matthew 12, 6 tells us one greater than the temple is here. But that will, it will return to fill the new temple, the one that uh, uh, Ezekiel is going to detail for us in chapters 40 through 48. When, that, when, he, when the uh, Shekinah comes and cleanses that temple, the final temple, the big one. So for your next session, I want you to reread chapter 1 on your own and reflect yourself on what it means to you. What does this strange vision uh, mean to you? It's there not presuming that you're trained in advanced math or hyperspaces. What does it say to you? Decide for yourself. Then I want you to read chapters 2 and 3. We'll take both of those chapters uh, the next time we get together. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for this unusual ministry that you've treated us with through Ezekiel. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would... Use these things to speak to our very souls, that we might hear you and what you would have of us in these days that in which we live. We pray, Father, you'd help each of us to understand and discern what these things mean to us here now, today, as we commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.